What's up, witches? Welcome to another episode of the Better Witch Podcast presented by the Modern Witch Network. I'm your host, Allie, aka Bronx Witch. I'm a tarot reader, Reiki healer, and owner of Bronx Witch Headquarters, a conjure shop and witchy workshare space in the Bronx, New York. And I'm going to be coming to you every week with a new topic and perhaps a guest co-host to share our real life experiences and some of the things we've learned along the way as practicing witches. Because when we know better, we witch better. Our guest co-host today is Juliette Diaz. Juliette is a bruja, seer, and spiritual activist. She's an indigenous Taino Cubana from a long line of curanderos and brujas. Juliette is a multiple best-selling author. Her works include Witchery, Embrace the Witch Within, which has sold to over nine countries, Plant Witchery, The Altar Within, and several oracle decks. Juliette is also the founder of Spirit Bound Press and Literary Craft Society. She's been featured in major publications like Oprah Magazine, The Atlantic, Wired, People Espanol, Mind Body Green, and Refinery, to name a few. We are going to talk about being a green witch, connecting with nature, and all that fun stuff. But first, we are going to talk about your dark garden. I am so excited. I saw you post about this, and I was like, yes, I want to do this when I have a house. Maybe I'll start it before I even have a house and just have, like, window plants of this. But the idea of an all-dark garden, I've always loved this. I've always been drawn to houses, like New England-style witchy houses, but that have, like, dark foliage. Yes. I love that. So what's the progress with the dark garden? I saw you selecting seeds. Like, where are we with that? So right now, just this morning when I left, um, I went to the nail salon. Yes, <laughs> was, yes, important. For the first time in a long time. Priorities. Um, they're already, their stems are sprouting. So what I didn't realize is that they take a few weeks for them to sprout in the first place, but their stems are so long. So right mm -hmm. now we have long stems and you can see the little buds and they're starting to open. So I'm waiting so I can take video and photograph them. So I have a good amount of land here and I live in a town or usually when you come around, you know, nature, you see a lot of colorful, beautiful flowers, but it's all kind of the same yeah. every single year. Yeah. And I do want to be smart with um, our living situation, right? I'm like, we're always thinking because of my past and knowing that you have to respect money and you have to respect that not everything lasts and God forbid something happens. I was like, Something that I love is plants and flowers. What can I do in my own land that's going to help me financially in the future mm -hmm, or that mm -hmm. I can dabble in that? So I thought to have a flower farm and have that flower farm be, you know, the darker um, tones, those dark reds, those blacks, those velvets. Yeah, they're flowers. hard to find. They're really hard to find. And some of them are really hard to grow if you don't pay you know, pay mind, you have to care for them more. Mm -hmm. So it is a learning experience for me to actually do it on the land and not have it in pots like I usually do. But I'm excited yeah. to see how they turn out. I'm learning how to do um, also spanning them out so that once the first round of them grows, I have another round growing so I don't run out. So I didn't even, you know, once you start thinking about um, trying to do kind of like a business with the flowers, you don't think about those parts like how do you have a whole summer full of flowers because usually they sprout and they'll wither away but there's a, a method to the planting and seeding i so, didn't even think about that because yeah i would be like look at my flowers cut 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 and then i'd be like oh that's it see you guys <laughs> next year <laughs> no oops are you, grow too, are you grow too many and god forbid you know people don't come and pick it up but already my house is drawing attention because it is a dark house i painted it like a dark slate gray it's black mm -hmm. Um, against the green of like of nature, it really pops out. So I'm really aesthetically driven when it comes to my magic 
and what drives me on on being connected to nature mm -hmm. aesthetics does play a part of it like glamour magic for instance right. so for me my eye when it's drawn to something it, it you know captures my attention it captures my soul and like you said those dark flowers do the same thing to me you know mm -hmm. a lot of us do don't understand that if we do come from backgrounds of trauma of of being alone um, we befriended the shadows we befriended darkness we yeah. befriended that that um that sadness and loneliness we befriended it to a point that it's become kind of a comfort to us so even when we're at our best when we're healed or we're still on our healing journeys we can't forget the shadows and the darkness we can't forget the darker parts of nature because those are the ones that were there for you in the first place they weren't mm -hmm. there to harm you they were there to befriend you and comfort you and i've always said that i've always said like the darkness is what kept me alive it's what saved me it understood what i was going through it understood where my brokenness was and it just held on to me and never let me go until i finally you know was able to walk on my own and heal through all the shit that i was going through so mm -hmm. yeah that's where the garden <laughs> inspiration yeah because i was gonna ask you like is the garden is it aesthetic or does it play into your magic and your your vision of yourself as a witch and as a practitioner um yes. like what's the overlap it's definitely part of both aesthetic and, and definitely 80 percent of my healing journey and how my magic actually works for me because mm -hmm. my magic comes from that deep dark place okay. that's where it's always come from um people of color my ancestors our ancestors magic for them was a, a, a way of activism protect of protection of survival right. Right. and when i went through all that trauma you know i didn't go grow up going through what my ancestors ancestors went through but we still went through similar hardships because we're my parents are immigrant to the country i'm first generation i mean there's a lot of things you know in this country that you know kind of pushes back on who you are right um but the darkness the dark flowers the dark foliage even when i post images of my land or the woods around me they're always in a darker aesthetic because there's a moodiness and a vibration that's very healing and familiar to me and you can't take familiarity away from people who've been attached to that for healing purposes, for survival purposes. So my mm -hmm. magic does kind of dabble a lot in the shadow and the darkness and those darker colors and tones. Yeah, and you know, the what you're talking about sounds very like, the word I wanna use is primordial. And to me, that seems very connected to both our existence and the plant world. Like we all kind of come out of this dark soup you know of of the start of creation and there's all this potential and opportunity there so it makes sense to me that that would also be a great source of magical energy as well because well we talk about how important visualization is and manifestation and if you are dealing with an energy where all realities are possible well the world really is your oyster so we talk about this energy as like a dark energy and it is um but certainly not in uh, in the way that like people think i think it's more dark in the sense of like before uh the canvas gets painted on kind yes. of a darkness not it's like a Ugh, darkness it's just like a, a a before the light before the opportunity before we start putting things in boxes or putting labels on things. It's just like the endlessness that could be. Yeah, I mean, that's where we come from naturally, the womb. The womb is dark for us. Plants and nature, they start under the ground where it's dark, complete right. darkness. Right. So we have to, we come from that, that space that we've been taught to fear. We've been taught to fear darkness. We've been taught to fear the shadows. And I truly believe, because I am a, a spiritual activist, I truly believe that this has been done not only for um, for people to kind of separate amongst each other um, for the shades of our skin, but also because they don't want us to know where our true power comes from, mm -hmm. where it was rooted. Mm -hmm. There is no true power within you if you can't acknowledge that you are both shadow and light. You are darkness. Um, it's part of who you are, quite literally. And you can't birth a, a new future for yourself or manifest a new self or heal um, if you don't acknowledge that what got you in this 
earth in the first place and giving you breath in the first place is the divine darkness mm -hmm. and it's just as powerful as light and they're both equally um important and that's something that's been stripped away from us since colonization by the way and that's why i do a lot of the colonial work and why a lot of the community is like what is she talking about but mm -hmm. eventually they will understand that um decolonizing it's really key to everything right it's going back to our roots right. before we were told you know black is bad you know white is you know uh, the hierarchy the, the perfection and it really all ties in together from nature to our spirit to even religion and politics mm -hmm. so that's why i have such um a love and is and passion for green witchery in general because it's our roots we're all from this earth we're all children of the earth yeah. and if we can go back to that place back to that root dark back to that dark place where we were all birthed from and we would see the importance of it i love so much that you mentioned two two important p words power and politics yeah. Um, and, and I want to talk about that a little bit because, uh, that is a big factor in, in the green witchery, both of these things. So first of all, power, um, the idea of being connected to something much deeper than this physical body, um, for me really came by interacting with herbs first. That was my first entry into what people probably call call animism this idea wow. that there is a life force and a being and a spirit inside of things that don't have arms and legs and walk around like other people and that they are just as alive and can be communicated with contracted with all of these different things so there is a power in being a green witch that is really beautiful especially because the herbs as i have seen it really seem to have a special duty uh, in their existence of healing and bringing us medicine. So it's super powerful to be able to connect with the earth for medicine or otherwise. But then there's also the politics of it. Um, the ideas of people of color being removed from their lands, removed from the natural uh foliage the plant life that they are used to working with i live here in new york city this is colonized lenape muncie native land and the story of the lenape people as is the story of all of the american indigenous is so terribly sad but one thing that really saddens me is the lenape people were taken from this land and where they were relocated to was in oklahoma so you take a group of people that live on the water, on the East Coast, that have a certain type of plant life around them, vegetables, fruits, things that they live off of and eat, not to mention the seafood and the, the animals, and then move them to a place where what grows is totally yeah. different and, and, and really in desert area, kind of non-existent. And what an effective yeah way to politically take the power away from a group of people we take your land we move you but we take you away from the earth that yeah. you knew the I mean, plants that you knew like yeah. that is super intense political control and a huge disadvantage of col colonialization and not to mention i'll just throw in there before you respond uh the laws after that that then prevented people from foraging on public yep. land, growing vegetables of their own. I mean, we still have laws against collecting rainwater in your own home uh, in some places. So the power and the politics of being a green witch is is immense, especially for people of color, I think. Yeah, people underestimate green witchcraft. I mean, I didn't even you know, call it green witchcraft. I that was just, you know, the practice of my ancestors was nature. Mm -hmm. Um is nature. My apologies before they kick my ass. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> they're like it was, but right it, here. Yep. Yeah, even as just people of color, where are we located? Where are they pushing us to? There are cities, right? Where there's hardly any nature and the trees that you do have there are male trees causing allergies. There's no you know, there should be an abundance of trees 
with fruits on them. Can you imagine New York City and having apple trees? Oh my and gosh, gardens? I have said the same thing. Now we do have a rat problem, which we might need to address first. But aside from that, I have said so many times that how great would it be if we planted fruit bearing trees? We have all of these people that we claim we cannot feed. But what if we had fruit bearing trees around the city that people could There's legally forage from? A country that claims to be the best country in the world has the most homelessness because they strip away our sources like nature. Right. We are homeless. I was homeless and I could not get help for the life of me. I mean, just for me to get assistance, they wanted me, they were like, you need to have a child for us to give you certain assistance. I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to college and I'm yeah. homeless and yeah. you won't help me. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, working my ass off for this. So the systems in place, we already know they're, they're awful. They're in place to make shit harder for us. They're almost impossible. Um, and again, going back to nature, like you said, it's it was really, I don't want to cry, but I moved out here to the mountains last year. Sorry. No, please. <laughs> This is a safe space. This is a safe space. It's just so crazy to me that, you know, most of the people living out here are white folks. And it's and I, and I look at them, I'm like, wow, what a life they have lived in tune with nature. And I don't think they even realize how precious it is. Their town full of trees and rivers. And this is something that was stripped from us. Like we feel this in our fucking soul. Like when we yeah. go out to nature, you know, we feel the connection, we feel the spirit because it's part of who we are. That's how our ancestors roam. That's what our ancestors were connected to. I remember trying to kind of um, connect to my identity because when my mother came from Cuba to this country, people were like, oh, they're, you're Cuban, you're not indigenous. We're indigenous Taino. This is like, that. this is what I do. I've been doing this for the last, I don't know, seven years of bringing truth to our indigenous ancestors. Mm -hmm. But even just coming to this country in particular, you know, you're told you're not indigenous. You're, you're told that, you know, you're now American. Now you have to, you know, um, speak English. Like they try to in almost immediately erase us and kind of take away our identities and our cultures. And this is the problem that we have. And if we only knew that to start claiming our identities is by connecting to nature because yeah. that is where our ancestors last left and where we are reborn and the lands the trees the plants the herbs even just making magic and potion with them even cooking with them that all connects us to our ancestral magic mm -hmm. um and ancestral wisdom and if we start to all even if we're not good at it just say where can I start? Where can I start connecting to my ancestors, connecting to my true identity? Look to earth, your mother is literally all over you. Right, right, yeah. And I, that's something that I wanted to, to ask you for our viewers because um, I know that we have a lot of listeners and watchers who are new witches um, or who may be uh, new to the idea of green witchery and are wondering where to get started um, because I know a lot of us you know, put ourselves into these boxes. Oh, I, I, I have a brown thumb. I, I, I can't grow anything. Everything I try to grow dies. Or, uh, you know, some of us might get intimidated by all the knowledge because every plant has a million properties and chemical compounds. And there, it's a lot, you know, obviously the herbalists that most of us really look up to and follow, they've been doing this for decades and they've been studying for decades. They may have degrees in herbalism or in uh, different biological studies and things like that. So for the new witch, it might be a little intimidating, this whole world, the bot the, the botanical world, I mean, millions of, of things to do. So if, if I'm a, a new witch and, and I know that I want to connect to the earth, but I'm just not sure how to do that, uh, and get started in a way that's maybe easy to wrap my head around or budget friendly. Um, where, where, where could I start? And I'm really interested to hear what you what you have to say because I know that you were in in life circumstances like being without a home, so you were able to overcome a lot of challenges that maybe some of our listeners are dealing with in terms of, you know getting in touch with nature when you don't have sprawling acres yeah, right? <laughs> and handed down to you from the family plot, you know? Yeah, I was stolen in the first place. Right. I had to put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first thing is take out of your head that 
you need you have a green thumb nobody that is something that's made up mm -hmm. um take away movies take away those magical witchy movies from the fact that that's not how green witchery actually functions no one is born magically able to you know work with plants and know everything about them there is practice there is a relationship that needs to be built so with that said you can be someone that's never worked with plants before or someone that maybe your plants don't survive as often and you can still start right now and start working from the grounds of building a relationship with nature first you need to understand who you are and your place in nature. Once you realize that you are nature, that you're part of this life, you're part of the earth, you are the trees, you are those plants, and they are vibrationally speaking to you always, that's where you start. You have to acknowledge that first. And then you can move into having a relationship. For instance, I always say start with the seasons. Okay. So get a journal and I have I, I wrote it down here, a seasonal journal. And for every season, like I, we have all seasons here, so do you in New York. Um, for each season, write down not what you're going through in the day, but your connections or any feelings to the weather. If it rains, how it made you feel emotionally, physically, mentally. Mm -hmm. um, if it snowed, the same thing. How does it feel when right now summer is, you know, at its prime, but I can already sense fall coming moving through beneath our our feet right yeah. it's like a rumbling happening beneath our feet where it's already tired earth is ready to go and shed and she's ready to go into her stage oh yeah of, she has she's she hot she hot right now she ready she ready to the, pull off yeah with all the bullshit happening in this earth too yeah like i need a nap mm -hmm. <laughs> so you connect yourself and create a relationship with the seasons because the seasons are the moods and the cycles of the earth, which we have those same cycles. Just like the moon cycles, the seasonal cycles are just as important. They are the ones that dictate or tell us, you know, when we need rest, when to slow down, when to speed up, when to go for more activity, when to go into more introspection. Right. The seasons are really powerful in helping you connect with nature, period. And that's something that a lot of people kind of don't look at or skip over. Um, another one is be really mindful about the plants and herbs that you're working with. You mentioned, you know, realizing that, you know, everything has a spirit and it does. Mm -hmm. So how do you take that to the next level? You know, just knowing that it has a spirit. Okay, now what do I do um, about this? How do I move forward? It's just like if you had a new partner and your partner and yourself are getting to know each other. But there, it's a little tough because sometimes, I mean, I'm able to communicate with them, but because of practice, because of building a relationship. Right. So if that's somewhere in the, if you're beginning with that, start with just having one fucking plant. I don't know if I could cur a curse. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I have to check with somebody, but I think so. <laughs> just one plant. Start with one. Don't overdo it at first. Maybe next month you can get two more, three more. Start with one because that is your guest. It is not something you own. It is not something that's gonna work for you. It is your guest and you need to start a relationship with that plant. And once you have started that relation with that plant, you're gonna see that you're gonna notice little things like that plant is not okay with the amount of sunlight you're giving it. And every time a plant is not doing well, don't take it as a sign of defeat. Take it as a sign that the plant is communicating with you and it's like, I don't like the situation. This environment is not good for me. I'm trying to tell you by my appearance. So now take action by saying, okay, my plant's not doing so well and be happy about it because the plant is speaking to you. It's letting you know it needs something that you're not giving it or it needs a change of maybe something that you were giving it and it's not working for it. Right. So building a relationship, being mindful, watching that plant. Um, and also the best part about being a green witch for me is the kitchen. So yeah. even if you don't want to start with plants, start in the kitchen. And if you're already cooking, now put focus into every single ingredient that you're using has a spirit, is right. alive, has medicine, has wisdom, has a connection to your ancestors, has a connection to the earth. Mm -hmm. 
So when you start respecting even your basil, right, that you're putting on your food, it, it just it just becomes a lifestyle of you know respect and exchange that builds up within you and kind of opens you up to the world of plants where you can start to practice a lot deeper and kind of um, create a knowledge within yourself and an alignment with nature that, you know, just continues to grow. I absolutely love the advice of starting with just one. And if I can piggyback off of that in terms of like which one to start with, um, something that I heard someone mention, I just took it with me and thought it was really useful advice is to start with a plant that you actually would use in your practice. Yes. And so that might be that might be in your magic. Like if you really love to burn sage to cleanse and to clear, then start growing some kitchen sage. If you are uh, you know, or or your practice could even be like you're cooking, you know, if you cook a lot, I cook pretty often with basil, but just not enough for me to get it from the grocery store every week. And then if I do get it for one dish, it tends to go bad. Right. And I'm like, ah. Oh. And after a while I was like, wait a minute, I have a solution to this. What if I grew a basil plant on the window? Then I could take a couple of leaves when I want to cook with it. And if I don't cook anything with basil for the next month, it doesn't matter. It, you know, everything is going to be fine. It's not going to go bad in the fridge. So that was where I started because I consider myself someone with a quote unquote brown thumb. Like anytime I would get a plant, it would never survive. I was always struggling. I was an overwaterer was my problem. Oh yeah, overbearing parents. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was an overwaterer. Uh, some some real emotional issues needed to be resolved yes. there was my problem. Um, but uh, starting with the plants that I would actually have use for really helped me. And now I have a rosemary plant and a root plant and like 15 other plants that are not edible. But um, it kind of took off from there for me. Um, so I definitely think that's really helpful, helpful advice. But I also think it's really beautiful what you said at the beginning where you mentioned that we are nature. And we, we are, are the tree. We are the plant. That was... Um, very pivotal for me as well like realizing that i'm caring for this being the same way i would want yes. myself to be cared for kind of helped to get rid of that feeling of separation because i would feel so frustrated i would look at my plant and i'd be like what is wrong with you i've been watering you i don't know what the deal is i've got my little apps i'm trying to identify what your problem is i don't know is it too much is it too little and it's frustrating and some of that frustration has gone away from me as i've started to connect with them more as spirits and it's less of like oh my god you're this mystery thing that i have to figure out and more like well if I looked like that, what would be wrong with me? Yes. If, if I was drooping, what would that mean to me? If I had spots, what might that mean to me? Is the water here good? Is the air here good? Am I getting enough sunlight? And then you said, you know, the plant is kind of talking to you and telling you about your environment. In a lot of ways, if you see the plant as an extension of yourself, it can kind of be like an indicator of what's going on with you. Yeah. So like if the if there if the water is doing something like I used to water my plants with tap water uh, here in New York, it's filled mm -hmm. with chemicals. Yeah. Now everyone talks about how good New York's water tastes, but that's because we fry everything out of it with like tons of chlorine and fluoride. So that's why it tastes so clean. It's it's just, you know, er eradicated of all life. Um, and my plants, I noticed, I had a bamboo plant on my ancestor altar and at, uh, I only gave it spring water because I always give my altar spring water. But at this time I wasn't giving my plants spring water because I was like, y'all are plants, you know, whatever, water, water, right? One week I was out of spring water, I didn't go to the grocery store and I was like, oh, it'll be fine. I watered my bamboo plant with water from like my, my kitchen refrigerator water filter so i'm like it's filtered water it'll be fine when i tell you that thing died like i turned around three days later and i was like oh shit it was like completely brown it had gotten root rot it was being fried apart i started doing research and i found out that it could be the water and when i switched to spring water everything started to change but then i had this moment of like well, damn, should I be drinking this water? <laughs> and now I'm drinking spring water, which is, you know, a new budget to take. But 
the, but the point is, is that the, my working with the plants and watching how the environment I was creating for the plant wasn't working for it, made me look at the environment for myself. And I was like, if my plants can't live in here, wait a minute, maybe there's some stuff in here that isn't so good for me either. And that was a powerful moment of how my plants are like, yeah. my buddies kind of tell me how things are going. Yeah, that's exactly what I like in the book, Plant Witchery Tree that I wrote. I go into detail about that. It's when there's something wrong, nature is life lessons to us. It's always been since our ancestors. How did our ancestors learn how to make medicine? How do they know which ones were medicinal? It's because they created a relationship and knew that working with nature was the same as how you treat it yourself. Discovering nature is like self discovery. So, one of my favorite. I wrote the quote, but still it's like my favorite one because I was smoking cannabis when it kind of hit me. This realization is when there's something wrong with the plant, um, there's nothing wrong with the plant. It's the environment is in. So we are, as humans, we are so used to thinking that we need to be fixed. Something's wrong with us. And it's not. It's our environment that's causing our harm, our sickness, our mental health, right? from the foods we eat to the people that we are with to what we ingest um, musically or what we read tv all of that has effects on us you know we're not meant to be these humans who are you know every day on our social medias and technology that's not how how we are um created to function in this earth right so less of that and more of um, the self care, the the nutrients that you need, the, the nourishment that you need, um, is really important. Just as it is with nature, if you don't give nature the nourishment that it needs, the love that it needs, you see it depleting. You see it becoming sick, and the same applies to us. And when you mention overwatering, you right away you're you're very. You're, I can tell you're really in tune with um, your plants already. It's overwatering. And having this urge to, you know, be overprotective and take care of your plant too much and be there for them too much, I was there. I did the same freaking shit. Mm -hmm. And I used to do it with cactus. Imagine my poor cactus. <laughs> your cactus is like, Juliet, do you understand? Really? Do, you, do you not understand what I am? I am a cactus, like, my friend. She's telling me. <laughs> <laughs> but for me... The realization was not that I was being overprotective personally when I was overwatering them or overfeeding them. I was like, I do that with myself. Mm. I overfeed myself when I'm anxious, when I, I feel depressed, when I'm lost or I feel lonely. Right. Um, I don't drink enough water. So here I am thinking I need to over like water these plants and here i am not even watering myself right so it was really a, a healing journey and that and when that started when you start building a relationship and you're at the beginning when you're starting um your plants are gonna die they're gonna die and, and it's not something you know some people will be like oh that's awful to me it's not awful to me it's a start of a beautiful relationship with who you are and the earth because you're the same thing and if you don't go through those trials, you don't go through those lessons of how do you care for a plant? How do you really listen? How do you mindfully actually care and love a being that's not from yourself? You have to start loving and caring for yourself first. So if we don't pay attention to us in the way that we want to care for others, it's going to show. You know how they say you can't love someone if you don't love yourself? Mm -hmm. I do believe you can't because I've loved many people and not had love for myself. Right. But what I did notice is that the love that I was giving other people was false sense in the way that they didn't know who I was. So there was no way for them to love me back for who I was. That love wasn't in the equal exchange. So I've learned that, you know, in order for me to properly love someone else and receive that love back, um, I had to love myself. I had to know who I was. I had to know what I wanted for myself as a self care where my limits were, what nourishment I actually needed in order for that to be reflected back on me. And that's the same thing with nature. It's hard and you don't need to know all the ingredients. You know, don't need to know all the properties. You don't know. I don't know all of them. Are you freaking insane? I'm 41. <laughs> my book has 200 plants in there and writing that book was like a massive, 
you know, a, right. a massive work and spiritually and mentally, and I channel every single one of them. So just with 200 of them. So imagine all of them in the world. That's something that you kind of need to detach yourself from is that feeling of perfectionism. That's also capitalist society. That's colonized mindset. Right. There is no needing to be perfect at anything. If anything, the journey of being a green witch is the journey of lesson, the journey of connection and alignment. You're learning mm -hmm. along the way. You will never be someone who knows everything. And that should be comforting to you. Yeah. That should be something that tells you I'm going to push through my fear um, and hesitation and do this shit because I'm capable, because I don't need to have everything. And going back to your original question, when I was homeless, even growing up with my family, immigrants to this country, we didn't have a lot of money. So it's not like, you know, a lot of us are used to going to the plant shops, buying plants and all this stuff. Right. I had to forage in america in a country that you know my mom was new to we lived um surrounded by cemetery mm -hmm. so the first things i noticed um the first thing she taught me was the weeds you know what whatever was growing on that land get to know the land befriend the land that's something that's also very important whatever land you're on first find out what land you're on who was there before you know colonization mm -hmm. who did it belong to what spirits are there what native plants are there? What native trees are there? Start with those beings. Those beings are the ones that are there with you. So you should start working with them first. They're the ones that are going to help you out the most because you're showing respect, because you're showing an initiative of caring and wanting to align and connect with them. So they will be really open with kind of carrying you throughout the lands and showing you, you know, different things that you might have not um, realized before. I think now it's a good time to take a break. about the land and the land spirits for those uh, witches who are out there trying to forage or um, get to know nature from the land that they are working on um, or, or living on knowing the native people if you guys don't know there's a website called nativeland.ca it's native-land.ca um, I'll try to remember to, you know, link it or put it in the information for this episode. Uh, but it's a really great resource. You can just enter in your zip code and it will show you uh, the different uh, indigenous territories and give you an idea of what people uh, may have lived on the land before you did. But I think that's a beautiful way to basically like if you feel like you're having a hard time connecting with earth, connecting with nature, working with plants, um, any of that connecting with the land spirit might be a great way to basically get a teacher on the other side, like get a guide, you know, like I'm struggling with this. I don't know how to identify any of these plants. Maybe I'm not even from this area. I just moved here and I want to know what's safe to eat. I want to know what um, to grow or what to have in my garden. What What's native here? Help me, show me, teach me things. Now, of course, please, before you eat anything or rub it all over your body, you know, make sure to do some tests, look it up <laughs> exactly or touch it have a field guide and all of that stuff i'm you know but um to help you along that path making making nice with the spirits of the land and the plants around you is going to uh help you can leave them offerings you can you know spend time with them and just let them know that you need their help in terms of learning 
and they will be there for you. And I think that'll be really helpful for folks to, especially if you're very, very new to any type of practice and the idea of animism is totally, totally new to you. A chair is a chair, a tree is a tree, and you, this is a very whole new way of looking at the world, of seeing the spirit within any of these things or seeing these things as truly alive. If this is really new to you, that might be a really helpful way to start to see the spirits by actually talking to them and asking them to help. Um, I think you might be pleasantly surprised the types of, when, when I have journeyed with plants, um, it has been so surprising to be like, oh shit, this plant really just came to me. Yes, like, yes. Mm -hmm. like we just had a conversation like i just had a conversation with this plant she's now a like chick that lives in my head i know what she looks like if i saw her on the street i'd be like oh snap that's blue lotus yeah <laughs> you know joke. blue lotus is just egyptian princess divine she's fantastic she comes to me just dripping in the blue and the white and she's ready to rock and you know you start to have those types of relationships with the plants and it takes you to another level. I do want to ask, um, because this is a question that I have personally had, um, a lot of times, especially when you are a new witch, or if you are, let's say, maybe an urban witch, or just in a place where getting in touch with nature is a little bit difficult, uh, we often go to work with dry herbs a lot because it's more accessible, it's easier to work with, and all of that. Am I still a green witch if all I have are dried herbs? that I've purchased to work with and I don't have places to grow things or a fresh herb to work with? Absolutely. I mean, it's a, a really um, privileged mindset to think or say to people that they're not something because they don't have access to resources or sources or even plants, right? So for instance, so, uh, when I was growing up, we went outside. That's where we got um, our plants, where we got our medicine, where we, you know, befriended the herbs and, and, you know, we dried them ourselves and we grew them on um, my mom's windowsills were all full of plants growing. Mm -hmm. Um, and even knowing some witches myself who are, you know, really great green witches, but don't have access, don't have the funds. Um, they find it easier to buy dry herbs in bulk. Um, just to save money to be able to pay rent and things like that. So for me, it's just common sense that, you know, you can't strip away um, the power and connection and alignment to um, green witchcraft just because of the, the supplies. And so I do believe that it does not matter what it is that you have. In fact, I go back to start with what you have. Mm -hmm. Use what you have. Work mm -hmm. with what you have or you have access to. That does not make you a better or a lesser witch. I've been in all levels in my life where, you know, I had nothing to like the point that I literally had to work with just the spirit, just conjuring that spirit in my presence, thinking about the flower. I'm thinking about dandelion right now because I, I remember specifically it was dandelion that I want to work with um, when I was homeless. And I, you know, I, I, um, I became really good at calling in dandelion spirit. And that's when I realized that you can't even work with their spirits. You don't even have to physically have them there unless you have, you're using them for a spell or a potion or yeah. a tincture or something like that or cooking with, but to just connect for their medicine, for their wisdom, for their guidance, you don't even need the plant to be there. The mm -hmm. spirit already lives within you. That's why, remember number one, you have to remember you are nature. You can conjure any spirit in the world that is nature, nature spirits, because you are nature. It is who you are. So mm -hmm. if you need to, you know, connect to willow tree and it's nowhere near you, you are capable of connecting to the willow tree. The willow tree is literally in your roots, in your system, in your soul, in your bones, because it is a part of who you are as the flesh, right? right. And as a spirit, we are our ancestors. We are the divine. So there is this magical element to us. That is our gifts, right? Our innate gifts is being spirit, is being able to connect to all that is. And we're here thinking that we have to have these special gifts that just come out of nowhere, like in the movies, nice. where, you know, that it's like magical fake witchcraft or fake magic. But we are very magical. It's just that we've been um, diluted to this mundane state that we don't see how powerful and how um, enchanting we truly are. Mm -hmm. So 
back to your question. I know I don't know if you knew you were gonna get a handful of words from me when I know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm just like soaking it all in. I'm just like uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Yeah. So like in my book, the the reason why plant witchery is doing so well, it's picking up now, is because I channel those plants and I go beyond the properties. They're not just properties. They're also wise beings. They're super wise. Yes. And a lot of plants, they don't give a shit about your feelings. A lot of them tell you just like it is. It's like that tough love. Mm -hmm. They want you to, to survive. They want you to do good. They want to guide you just like your guides and your ancestors and spirits, angels, whatever you believe in, whatever you call them, um, spirit, nature spirits are the same. Yeah. I always think of the plants as our ancestors really yes. because um, on the one hand they are ancient to us they pre most of them predate us they've been here for longer they've seen the earth go through all of these different phases Everything. they've seen us come along they'll be here when we're gone they'll be here in more abundance when we're gone um so they are eternal and they really are ancestral in that sense but they also like the ones that are uh, like the physical plants that are alive right now they are growing in the soil that is nourished with the bodies of the dead like yes. literally our we have returned to topsoil and from us the plants are growing so they really are ancestral like in a literal sense you know um so we have like the sort of spiritual like they have been here forever but also in a very literal way like that is what they have grown out of is all the death and decay of the world is, is why they're growing so they really are ancestor spirits so it's just a matter of being mindful being quiet being present okay that's the word i'm looking for being mm -hmm. present with the the what you're doing and how you're working with these plants and these flowers um, and these herbs um again tea is another great way if you don't have a lot of money to um, you know, access different herbs. Teas come with different herbs inside of them, but they are there's ones with singular ones. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know about you, I still go back to my Mexican food stores, the bodegas. I go back to them because they sell herbs very in a cheap and bulk in yep. bulk. Yep. Um, so if you're able to go into you know communities that have you know Latino or Spanish or cultural. Uh, markets and bodegas they have herbs that are mm -hmm. really great for you to purchase and at a cheaper price they're not marketed or raised up like if you would go to whole foods which yeah. i would never again in my life do that is so expensive it's so expensive <laughs> right? it's I, don't ridiculous. How I don't care how much money i end up having in my life I, yeah I just, i'm just like i can't money. wrap my head around an eight dollar apple i just i well, Right? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no matter how much I've got going on, but I, I, and I want to tell people for all the New York City witches, because I know that a few folks, uh, you know, are local to the area. Food Bazaar is your best friend. Okay, yeah. it's an ethnic supermarket. They have chamomile, hibiscus, they have lemon balm, like all in packages, and it'll be like a dollar. Yes, you know, and it may it may not be you know like <laughs> grown in your backyard or the freshest or whatever, but it's definitely a, a place to start. Yes, you can start with whatever you have or whatever you have access to, and another oh something that just came down. You can supplement. I don't know mm. not a conversation we were having, but yeah. I feel like it's a something that's going around and something that I get to ask a lot, even though I mention it in my books, I say you can supplement, people still ask. Right, right. Yes, right. you can supplement. There's so many different herbs for similar properties and similar um, wisdom that you can supplement with whatever it is that you have. And if you were like me, or hopefully you weren't, when I was homeless again, and I didn't have much, I would channel ingredients into my skull work. Mm. So what you do is the same thing like I just told you. But the, you start with the meditation, you grow into the channeling, and you're using that energy to move the energy out of your body and into your spell work. You can move it into anything that you like. Just like I remember I had um, an acorn that I kept with me all the time, and I would cleanse and clear that acorn at least every six months and then weave it with intentions that I needed for whatever I was going through. So if it was protection or if it was alignments or um, abundance or anything, I would use that energy of the plants and herbs that I remember working with with my mom and foraging and imbue them into um, that acorn. Mm -hmm. Or you can do that to a rock. Everything has spirit. Mm -hmm. So therefore, everything has energy. 
So therefore, yeah. you can literally weave magic with all, all, all things. You know, not every witch approaches their craft um, from a place of, of spirituality, I think. Um, but for those of us who do, I, I would count myself as, as one who does. Um, a relationship with the earth can really take your your magic to the next level. It really helps you to go on that inner journey if you're wondering what people are talking about when they talk about shadow work, when they talk about inner child work, when they talk about knowing yourself or trusting yourself. Um, these concepts can be kind of confusing until you get to the point in your life where you've got to do them or you know you start doing that. Um, but the plants can really help you on that journey. So if you're like, man, I want to be a witchcraft practitioner and I really want it to come from a place of like, of, of deep alignment and, and real knowledge of myself, not just as a the physical person, but as a spiritual being, uh, plants really can help you with that. And if, whether you identify yourself as a quote unquote green witch or not, because, you know, we all relate to the plant world so it's a term that can be used really for most witches probably right. but even if you don't identify with the term green witch i encourage all of the listeners all of the watchers to um to, to start building a relationship with plants whatever that means for you like we said in any of the examples a little handful of dried herb from a tea bag grabbing a plant from the grocery store, sitting outside with a tree if you have that luxury. You know, all of those things are all valid ways to build a relationship with the plants. But the benefit is that it really helps with the spiritual aspect of casting. It really helps because they're spirits, so they really I, help you with the spirit yeah. connection thing. And I feel like connecting with herb spirit or plant spirits can actually help you with other forms of spirit communication too if you're interested in speaking to spirits of the dead yes. or to angels or whatever and all of that is totally foreign to you start with seeing if you can connect to the spirit of the dandelions growing in your yard if you can i if you can perceive their spirit and talk to them and see them and feel a response then you can start doing that with other things and before you know it you may be chatting with grandma at the end of the bed you know in the middle of the night it might get that it's, vivid for you it's like martial arts right they have um something called katas mm -hmm. um i i'm actually a six degree and when we practice katas i used to be like this is stupid like this is not fighting <laughs> but <it's, laughs> there were movements um like routine movements that you would go through and I see those movements as that practice of connecting with earth because those movements, when you are in a situation when you need to defend yourself, they become actionable, they become physical. And the mm -hmm. movements are embedded in your body that you know what to do. And the same thing with um, plant witchery and earth, green magic is that is the foundations of who you are as a being. So the more you work and align with them, the more that they're going to show up those tools and those skill sets throughout anything that you do in life ever. Mm -hmm. um, deep breaths, for instance, um, I have like big anxiety, especially when I'm talking to people or in front of a crowd. I always, always go back to hibiscus. Hibiscus is some is a, a plant that it's really great for um, teaching you how to slow down and um, sucking in really powerful breaths so anytime i'm scared or anxious i channel hibiscus almost instantly and the first thing hibiscus makes me do is take deep breaths mm. and kind of like push that energy anxious energy out with my breath so i've learned that you know working and befriending or and having them around has shown up in, in different parts of my life that's actually helped me there's definitely something flying in my face oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> yeah, no, but I can't see it here, so I don't know. So maybe it's <laughs> the spirit of hibiscus. Like, I'm like, uh, <laughs> my, like flicking my eyelashes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I think that was um, a beautiful and a great example of like um, how connecting with the plants is can show up in other parts of your life. You know, you're not making a cup of tea or planting anything. This is when you're getting ready to go on stage somewhere yeah. and there's not a hibiscus plant anywhere near. Yeah. But having established that relationship with that plant means the spirit of that plant can come to you and be with you and help you through things. And that's just 
Amazing, and I think a really great note to leave it on because uh, we have been chatting, chatting, chatting away. I wow. want to thank you so, so much. Uh, before I uh, let you go, just can you let mm -hmm. folks know where they can find you right now, uh, what they should be looking out for from you? Um, all my social media is at I am Juliet Diaz. No underscores, no, I don't do reading. So as oh soon as gosh. you follow me, you're going to be hit up with impersonators. So right. just know that I don't do readings and I am Juliet is literally my only handle on all platforms. Um, because of the blessing of the success of my books um, and, and, you know, being respected in the community of the magical community, I really do hold that to a really high level um, and admiration and gratitude that I always try to find a way of how can I live the rest of my life giving back? Mm -hmm. um, because all of my dreams have come true because of community, because of um, that unity and trust in my work and with, with each other. So now I'm not just an author. I have Spiritbound Press, which is a publishing imprint. And what I've seen in the magical and spiritual communities is really concerning. It's something that we've all been seeing, especially people of color, um, queer people, LGBT um, plus communities. We've all noticed the hatred, the racism, um, the appropriation, all of the things that are, are really harmful and toxic to um, our communities. And then to the new people who are curious about coming into the craft, they're, you know, they're being pushed away because of what they're seeing and hearing and, and, and all of that. So what we're what I am focused on, remember I told you I'm turning my activism mm -hmm. into a certain way, instead of focusing on all the problems that's going on and, and wasting my energy on that, even though that is important, there are people doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving it to those people to take that up because I used to do that. Now I'm moving into a phase where I am building something new. My publishing house is diverse and inclusive, magical and spiritual works. Um, and you're going to see all kinds of people who are from those cultures and practices publishing books through my house. I like I'm so tired of seeing magical books being written by people who aren't even witches or from mm. those cultures. And, and it's, or they're using, you know, um, information that's ancient, like old that, you know, it's recycled over and over. There's nothing new, nothing channeled through a person's being a spirit that, you know, is adding to, you know, all the wonderful books that are already out there. Right. So it, um, Spirit Bound Press, that is the name on social media. Um, and we're brand new. I already signed nine authors. We start Ooh. our first releases next year. Yeah. Um, so something that I would really love support in is with Spiritbound Press because it's not about me. It's about everyone else in the community um, and opening that door and keeping it fucking open for everybody else, right? Yes, absolutely. It's something that we need to learn. It's really hard for people like us to get in the door. It's really a miracle that my books are doing so well. As an indigenous person, a Cuban, you know, um, Im daughter to immigrants, first generation, you know, mm -hmm. a witch, a woman, like all of these things that, you know, work against you, sadly, still to this day, when you make it through as a community, what that means is when one of you make it, we all make it is because when you make it, you have a responsibility or I feel I have a responsibility to keep that door open yeah, so that everyone can come through. Right. Because if we don't keep that door open, you're ending it at you and nothing really changes. It, there's like we have to wait for another big miracle to happen. Right. So I don't t take lightly to the success that I have. I don't take lightly of the support that I'm given by the community. Um, so Spiritbound Press is my vision for a better future for all of us. And, and one that really publishes and, and showcases voices that are not heard or pushed away. Um, and voices that belong on these shelves. Like I want all these shelves to be, you know, diverse and inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's really important. Yeah, I love that. Definitely, guys, make sure to check out Julia and all of their work and uh, the Spirit Brown Press and support the, you know, all the publications that come out from there. I think it's 
it's it's super important and that's probably you know another episode that we can do talking about the writing community and and the publishing houses that we have that have uh you know done done their part uh, and are doing their part but um some of the new publishers that are coming along that are really emphasizing voices that maybe have not been heard from before i think it's really needed and important so thank you for your work and i'm encouraging all of the listeners all of the viewers to definitely check out more from juliet diaz uh and i just want to thank you so much for being here thank you for having this conversation thank you. i'll visit you in new york when i'm not far away from you <laughs> Yes, please. You definitely do. I just want to thank the viewers and the listeners for being here with us and remind you guys that when we know better, we witch better. Awesome. Thank you, witches, for tuning in to another episode of the Better Witch Podcast presented by the Modern Witch Network. New episodes air every week. You can watch the video broadcast on YouTube every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern or listen to the audio version on your favorite podcast platform every Thursday. And if you're a Bronx Switch Coven member, join us right after each YouTube broadcast for a live Q&A about the episode. Whether you're watching on YouTube or tuning in on your favorite podcast platform, we want to know your thoughts on today's episode. So please make sure to leave reviews and drop comments wherever you are. You can show support for this podcast by grabbing some sweet merch and join the Bronx Switch Coven on YouTube for behind the scenes footage from today's episode and the details to join in on those live Q and A's. See you next week and blessed be. Mm -hmm.